Good morning and welcome to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your pharmacist, Paul White. We're very glad you joined us. It's hard to believe, but we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of Health Matters radio program. We are planning some special shows to celebrate the milestones, so we hope you will stay tuned. Let's begin today by thanking our sponsors, Cleveland Clinic Mercy Hospital, Studio Arts and Glass, and of course, our socially distant technical producer, J.D. DeAngelis. Joining me is Brad White, a compounding pharmacist, and our very special guest, Debbie Adams Shoemaker, manager and licensed speech pathologist from Cleveland Clinic Mercy Therapy Services. Welcome to the show. All right, good morning. <clears throat> so June is aphasia awareness month. Aphasia is an impairment of the language affecting the production of comprehension of speech and the ability to read or write. Aphasia is always due to brain injury to the brain. Most commonly, it's from a stroke, but it may also arise from head trauma, brain tumors, or infections. Mm -hmm. This morning, we're going to talk with Debbie about diagnosis, treatment, and recovery from aphasia. We'd like to remind our listeners that today's program is available on our podcast, so look for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy in your favorite podcast app, and please subscribe. So, Debbie, we understand you're a manager at... Mercy Therapy Services. Tell us a little about yourself and your clinical background. Um, well, get, first of all, thank you for inviting me today uh, to talk about aphasia. Um, I graduated with my master's in speech language pathology from the University of Akron way back in 1981. Um, my first position was in Akron. I worked at the Litchfield Rehab Center and it was a freestanding United Way agency, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where I worked with adults and children um, with varying communication disorders. I joined Mercy in 1987 and have been here almost 34 years. <clears throat> and I've worked with both children and adults um, in our outpatient uh, facilities, um, our outpatient facility here at the hospital, on our rehabilitation unit. And I've also provided some therapy um, in the home setting as well. And in, in the past, I've had the privilege to and work with um, managing the speech therapy departments, our um, therapy department on our rehab unit, um, our uh, outpatient therapy department at the hospital. And currently I'm the manager of two of our offsite facilities, our physical occupational and speech therapy department in New Philadelphia and our facility in Carrollton. Um, again, I'm a licensed speech language pathologist through the board of uh, the Ohio Board of, of State, uh, the State Board of Ohio. Um, and also hold the American uh, Certificate of Clinical Competence from our national organization. So there's not a lot of people that have ever heard the word aphasia. Oh, what is it? Yeah, uh, you're correct. It's, it's amazing how common it is and how many people don't have not heard of it. I, I found a statistic that um, was given a, a survey from the National Aphasia Association the results were 84% of the respondents never had heard of aphasia. So mm. that's quite a big percentage. Um, mm. Aphasia is a disorder uh, with when that results from damage to portions of the brain that are responsible for language production. Uh, in most individuals that's on the left side of our brain, there are some exceptions, um, but aphasia usually occurs very suddenly, usually after a stroke or head injury but can develop slowly. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as a result of other um, neurological disorders. Uh, aphasia can take on a lot of different faces. Uh, many times the patient cannot understand uh, spoken and written language. They may not be able to express themselves either through verbalization and writing or texting. Um, they may not be able to find the right word that they wanna use that's called anomia. And they may use a different word than they want to use. For example, they might want to say dog, but they say cat instead. Or it could be out of a completely different category. They may want to say dog, but the word cup comes out. Um, yeah. they, they may also uh, mispronounce the words. For example, if they want to say sleep, it may come out pee. Uh, with a lot of times the aphasic person knows that these errors are happening um, and that can be very frustrating for them. Man, that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, uh, we talked about how aphasia can be caused by a stroke. Would it be a head injury on a certain 
spot on the head or is it you know a car accident could happen or, or what are some examples if you don't mind yep a motor vehicle accident um a fall and again depending on where the lesion or the damage is in the brain um most people are left side dominant meaning that their left side of their brain controls all the language functions um so and again there are some i've had some patients where they're right side dominant left-handed but after a stroke or head injury, develop aphasia. So it doesn't always follow that rule, but that's the majority of, of the cases that I see. Do a high percentage of stroke vision victims have aphasia? Um, pretty high. Uh, our National Association has found that 25 to 40% of all stroke, I call them stroke survivors, um, have aphasia. And um, they're usually, it's more common in, stroke survivors over the age of 65. But again, under the age of 65, aphasia can occur. I've even had a, a pediatric patient, a child who had a stroke in utero while the mother was pregnant. Jeez. So that he had a very difficult time developing language. Um, it also can occur after what we call a transient ischemic attack or a TIA, also referred to more commonly probably as a mini stroke. Um, and those, that's, that symptom may, the symptoms of aphasia may come and go. So um, those are some scenarios for the development of aphasia. Hmm. So how common is it? Um, it's fairly common. Um, I was reading some more statistics about 2 million people currently in the United States are living with aphasia. Um, and about 180,000 Americans acquire it every year. So it's huh. fairly common. It's kind of scary. Okay. <laughs> so how about how about diagnosis? I mean, I I guess is it just by the feedback the patient gives, or is there a clinical evaluation that's done? Right. Again, well, you know, your first symptom is going to be that difficulty with language, um, or even comprehending language. Now, a physician can diagnose aphasia as well. Um, a speech language pathologist, we will give a series or a battery of standardized assessments, standardized tests that can tell us the type of aphasia, because there's many different types of aphasia, hmm. and also the severity of aphasia. So we get a little more in depth um, by assessing them via speech language pathology. Hmm. So what is aphasia a symptom of? Um, aphasia is a symptom of a result of a stroke. Uh, again, uh, patients can have um, an inability to speak. They may use shorter sentences. Uh, they may use sentences that people, other people cannot even understand. Um, they may have difficulty with reading, uh, with writing. The, the words that they want to write don't come out or the, the sentence, the words in the, the uh, sentence that are out of order. Um, you know, again, I think it's, it's so frustrating because there are many different types of aphasia. And I think we're gonna get into those shortly as well, but. Wow. How do you communicate with a person with aphasia? That's a very good question. Um, and through training, we'll, we'll talk about family involvement as well. There are many different ways to communicate with them. Uh, one is to slow your rate of speech, not to babyfy it per se, but to slow and give pauses so the aphasic patient can kind of process what's happening. Um, I like to use a lot of augmentative communication. I use a lot of gestures when I'm talking with a, an aphasic patient because what they might not be able to understand auditorily they might be able to understand visually. So, you know, using gestures or hot or cold or um, just facial expression, you know, knowing that uh, someone is pleased with their responses or fearful. So there's a lot of different ways to communicate with them. I think the biggest thing is, is slowing down your rate of speech and, and speaking to them in a normal conversational level. Um, and then, you know, verifying with that patient, did you understand what I said? Um, giving them choices is another great way, as opposed to saying, what do you want to drink? You might want to say, would you like coffee or tea? 
so that they have a choice. Um, I use a lot of yes, no questions as well, as opposed to open-ended, um, as opposed to how do you feel today? I might say, are you tired or are you feeling well? So you're giving them some choices as opposed to this very open-ended response. Um, okay. Every conversation is two way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking with a person with aphasia is, how do I say this, um, is the input that they receive normal or is it the same as um, them talking? Is that a right question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, again, I think that that varies on the type of aphasia the person has. You know, we're going to talk about Broca's aphasia, which is um, a more of a motor aphasia where the person understands what's being said to them, but they just can't get the words out. So, hmm. so it, it's going to depend basically on the type of aphasia and, and what kind of um, input that they understand the best. I always like to use what I call a multimodality input where I'm using speech, I'm using gestures. I even may use writing to help them understand what I'm saying. I've written out sentences before where they can then understand. So hmm. a lot of different ways to, to get that input. Okay, time for our first break. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Brad and I are with Debbie Adam Schumacher manager of Cleveland Clinic Mercy Therapy Services. So I understand there are three main types of aphasia. Can you explain Broca's? Did I say that right? Broca's? Yes, Broca's aphasia. Uh, or motor aphasia and how it affects the patients. Right, and it's also referred to as non-fluent aphasia. Hmm. Um, and the main uh, symptom of this, th these individuals can understand language fairly well. It just really impacts their ability to a, some degree of difficulty to express themselves. Um, it could be very mild or it could be very severe. Um, they just aren't able to get the word out. Um, you know, often my patients will say to me, you know, I, I know what it is. I, it's that thing. It's that thing. I know. But they just can't find the word that they're looking for and causes a lot of frustration for them. Um, they, they can't understand, um, again, so that makes it difficult because the individuals that they're talking with may not understand that fact that they can understand. So they, my, a lot of my other patients will say, you know, I just, I feel stupid. I, I'm so stupid. I can't get the words out. Mm. You know, so that's, it, it can be a very frustrating type of aphasia. Um, they can have trouble writing. Again, they're not able to find the word when they're trying to write mm. something. Um, texting nowadays is a big thing. They have trouble texting because they can't find the word. Um, they may not be able to sequence the spelling, but yet they're aware of these errors. And so that's what makes it very difficult. Um, we can use some different techniques with them. Um, one is if, a, if this aphasia is very severe, we have what's called augmentative communication where we, there, so we can come up with picture boards where the patient can, or the survivor can point the word that they're trying to say. Um, that's limiting like a picture board. There's only so much you can put on a picture board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or we can use more high-tech communication. They're actual computerized devices like a tablet that may have thousands of, of messages in there. And we can program that so the patient can then point and the device talks for them. Um, I've often Jeez. found that using these devices can actually help facilitate the language. The patient may start to try to imitate the word. Um, the more they hear it, the more their language develops. This is a complex disorder to deal with, isn't it? It's very complex, yes. So what about, is it Wernicke's? Aphasia, is that right? It is Wernicke's aphasia. And, and what, what, what is it and why is the most emotionally challenging consequences, consequences right. after a stroke? I, mean, I missed that part of that sentence. Go ahead. You got it anyway. <laughs> I find that it's also the most 
difficult um, aphasia to work with as well. Um, it's referred to as fluent aphasia, or you may hear it as receptive aphasia. In these individuals, they have difficulty speaking, reading, and writing language. The difference from Broca's is it's very fluent. Um, they may produce a very long sentence, but it makes no sense at all. Um, for example, I have a, a, an example of a sentence they may say, um, you know that smoodle picker that I want to get him around and take care of him like you want before. You know, it mm. doesn't make sense. It was fluent. The words flowed. There was good intonation. But and then the, the most difficult part, they have no idea what just came out. They have no self-awareness of their errors when they're speaking. Um, they have a very difficult time understanding language. So it's it's very frustrating. Uh, I'm sure inside their mind, they can't understand why somebody's not responding to them or not understanding what they're saying. But it's usually just mm. doesn't make sense. Mm, really, really difficult to probably the right wrong time to ask this question, but mm -hmm. do you get these people back at all, any of them? And that's another good question. Um, everybody recovers at different rates um, and individually. It's also dependent on, I think, the patient's age, um, their overall medical condition. If they have a lot of medical comorbidities, they may not recover as well. Um, it depends on the, the size of the lesion in the brain or the damage to the brain. Um, it also depends on their family support, um, their motivation. You know, in my, in my practice, I, I can't really say I've ever had anyone come back 100% close, but maybe not 100% because they may always have those days where due to stress level or how they're feeling, if they're fatigued, that their communication may break down. You know, think about how we feel when we don't feel well or we're tired. We may not communicate as well. I may not find the words I want to say as well. Um, I have a problem with that sometimes. So, you know, you multiply that several times with an aphasic patient. How many people do you have helping you, or is this your baby? Um, as far as, as working with work, yeah, working with individuals. Um, right now, you know, in my two sites, there's myself and I have another speech language pathologist that works both at Carrollton and, and Tuscarawas, um, our facilities there. Um, here at the hospital, um, we have a continuum of care. Uh, for example, uh, I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six speech language pathologists working in different areas. Uh, we have the acute care population, which is right after their stroke. We see that patient bedside and, and try to get to them as quickly as possible to start intervention. Uh, then from there, they may transition to our rehab unit where they get intensive therapy five days a week, sometimes an hour each day for just speech. They also get hmm. physical and occupational therapy as well. Um, and then from there, they transition to outpatient because um, many times more work is still needed to be done. Um, so we, you know, as a staff of speech pathologists alone, I believe we have six or seven of us here in the whole organization. Wow. Okay, Debbie, we got to get to the news here. So we got to hear what's happening in the world. So <laughs> thanks for listening, folks, to Health Matters. Just a quick reminder that Janssen's COVID vaccine is available for immunization at all of our medicine center pharmacies. We have, so we have a lot more to cover here this morning. So let's get back to the show. We have not discussed global aphasia. Okay, hey, global aphasia. Um, this is the most severe type of aphasia. As, this, as the term in, implies, all language modalities are affected. Um, it's usually caused by damage to the left side of the brain and a pretty large uh, amount of damage to that side. Um, patients have trouble understanding, speaking, reading, writing, even using gestures to communicate. So again, as the term implies, they're globally affected. Um, and it's another very hard one to, to deal with. 
So acquaint the listeners with what the left side of the brain is responsible for. In, in most individuals, um, you have different lobes in your brain. And in most individuals, the area of the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes are uh, responsible for language comprehension, language expression. Um, there are areas of the brain also that, that uh, control motor abilities, use of your arm, use of your leg. Uh, but that left side in most people controls the, the language. Does aphasia, um, does it affect the, the daily sort of routine things like brushing your teeth? They don't do, they forget that, and they, you know, cleansing, showers, bath, whatever, anything along that line? Aphasia per se does not. However, if you're a stroke survivor and have aphasia, you may have some physical uh, impairments. So it may affect your ability to use your hands to, again, brush your teeth or eat. Um, sometimes, again, with aphasia and brain damage in general, there may be some cognitive impairment where the, the patient may uh, not be able to sequence the steps on how to complete an activity. So the actual language component doesn't affect uh, daily routines, uh, motor daily routines, but any physical residuals can certainly contribute to that. Yeah. So I'm thinking about uh, physical therapy and a little bit of what you've described so far. How long could it take someone to recover from aphasia mm -hmm. and can they recover completely? Right. It's, in my experience, again, every patient uh, recovers differently at a different rate. Um, usually the first nine months after the onset of aphasia, you see the most improvement and probably the most rapid improvement. Now, that does not mean that improvement stops at that time. Uh, years ago, that was the theory. After nine months, you were done. But I've had patients and, and uh, stroke survivor friends that continue to make changes years after the onset of their aphasia. So, so recovery does not stop right at that time. Um, Makes sense. Have you had patients that had aphasia return to their jobs? Some, depending on their job, what their job was. If, if their job involved a lot of communication, let's say they were a sales rep or, or a car salesman, or they did a lot of phone work, that may be a little difficult to return to. Um, many employers um, have made accommodations for, for stroke survivors that want to return to work, again, because we're seeing younger and younger individuals suffering from stroke and aphasia. Um, I've had patients that may not return to the same job they were doing, but perhaps another job in the organization that they were employed with um, to become productive employees. I had one patient who was a car salesman. Obviously, the aphasia affected his ability to communicate, but his employer uh, hired him or, or is employing him for a, a runner. He takes things to different uh, dealerships and, and does mm -hmm. things like that. So definitely can return to the, the work environment. So I think I know the answer to this question, but does aphasia affect a person's intelligence? Yeah. Big no on that one. Um, that's probably one of my, my biggest pet peeves is, is so many individuals, and I've seen even healthcare individuals talk to an aphasic patient as if they didn't understand, really babyfied their speech um, you, you increase their volume. They think if they speak louder, they're going to understand better. Um, it, it does not affect their intelligence. It just affects the, the roadway to let them express what they know. The, the language impairment is in, in impairing that. Um, and again, I've had patients say to me, I'm stupid. And I, that's my first thing in my therapy sessions that we go over. No, that's absolutely not the case. Can you re-educate the other side of your brain to handle some of this stuff? You can. Um, I think the younger you are, the, the more plastic your brain can be, the more flexible your brain can be. Um, therapy works on the theory that we are using areas of the brain around the damaged area, as well as 
some skills that the other side of the brain may use, for example, gestures, um, you know, using other modalities to communicate. But we really try to tap on all those areas that have not been damaged. We have thousands, millions of brain cells that, that we have in our brain that we never use in our lifetime. So there's definitely a, a, a ability to retrain. Yes, I read one time that Albert Einstein's brain was only 10% used or, or yeah. something ridiculous, which is really hard to right, right. Hard, hard to <laughs> grab hold with. So as brilliant yeah. as he was. Many areas that we, we never use in our lifetime, so. Uh, hmm. So from a speech therapist perspective, what treatment options do you use at Mercy Medical Center? Um, to help think, patients recover. Mm -hmm. That that's highly individualized. Uh, you know, our goal in therapy is to achieve the highest level of independent functioning for that person in, in their daily living. So that is our goal. And so we try to capitalize on their strengths and address their weaknesses as well. Um, therapy can be restorative in nature, meaning that we, we work on improving those deficits. Um, through structured speech tests and repetition and homework, um, or it could be compensatory in nature, how we talked about using another way to communicate, um, either the, the augmentative devices that we talked about, gestures. Um, so again, it's highly individualized. Um, we usually offer our treatments, again, in-house, so the patient is on the acute care floors or uh, several times a week on our rehab unit five days a week. On outpatient, we usually try to get them in two to three times a week. Um, again, that's only for maybe 45 minutes to an hour that we are able to work with them. Um, that's where we'll talk about how the family comes into play later on here. But um, depending on the aphasia, we, we, work, we have structured therapy activities that we can work with. Um, there are many standardized treatment approaches that we can use. Uh, one in example I have fun with is called PACE, um, and that stands for Promoting Aphasics Communication Effectiveness. And it's kind of like a guessing game. I, I'll hold a card up and I'll give them cues. It may be a picture of a dog. I might say, okay, this is an animal. Um, it has four legs. It, it goes rough, rough. And then that patient can try to pull that word dog out. Then it's their turn. They give, they have a picture that I can't see and they try to communicate different um, ideas about that picture so that I know what they're talking about. So that's just one example. There are probably 20 different treatment approaches based on the type of aphasia that we can use. I think what we're getting um, from you is that there really isn't any cure for this. Is, is that like a total I'm like I used to be type thing. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if cure is the right word, but I like I said before, I I have seen patients come back almost to 100 percent. But there's always going to be that one day where maybe they're not feeling well or, you know, something is affecting them where their communication hmm. may break down. Um, it, it's a very difficult disorder to come back from. Oops. So you mentioned you were talking about therapy. Is the therapy for all types of aphasia the same? Uh, no, again, if, if it's a aphasia where the auditory processing or, and uh, understanding is affected, we, we focus on that, uh, having them understand yes, no questions or following simple commands. If it's a Broca's aphasia, we work a lot on name, naming pictures, naming description of objects, um, imitation, repeating sentences. So it just, again, depends on the type of aphasia that the patient has. Mm -hmm. So as a speech therapist, do you need any additional certifications for specific training um, according to aphasia? Right. No, I mean, we, we get a good deal of training in our, our master's degree program um, again, it's as professionals, it's our responsibility to always stay current with, you know, research, um, evidence-based uh, uh, treatments that show to be worth the best. 
um, a lot of continuing education that we would attend, as well as joining special interest groups through our national organization. So it's a constant learning journey. What about group therapy? Uh, is there such a thing, uh, you know, yes. getting, getting together with other individuals with aphasia? Yes. Um, there, there's a group therapy and there's also support groups. So I can address the group therapy first. Um, I used to run a group in my a previous employment where just having that group together and practicing certain exercises was very beneficial. They reinforced each other. They encouraged each other in their treatment. Um, and then there's support groups, which is a little bit different where uh, people come together just to support each other and ask questions and and how do you deal with this? And how did you do that? Um, and I think we'll get into that a little bit as well, our, our support group that we have access to. Okay. Our final break is here. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. We're talking with Debbie Adam Shoemaker, a licensed speech pathologist. So let's get back to the final segment of our show. Okay, at Mercy Therapy Services, do you also help a patient's family and friends learn about how to communicate with aphasia patients? Yes, that's a very important part of the, the program. Um, I think it's important that that family member or caregiver observes therapy, learns the different techniques. Again, because we only see them you know, two, three hours a day, they go home and they're with them 24 seven. So you know, to get that carryover, I think that's very important that they, they learn and practice those techniques. Um, also learning about how, as Paul had alluded to earlier, how to better communicate with their family member so as to decrease frustration and for them to be able to um, communicate their basic needs, their emotions, uh, their, what they're trying to get out. Do you have any tips or advice to give to patients of loved ones who are working with this challenging situation for communication? Uh, definitely, you know, practice, 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 I think is, is something that's very important, um, not only in the therapy sessions, but outside and in, in the real world. Um, for the family or, or, or communication partners, trying to simplify your language a little bit, slowing down your rate of speech, like we spoke about earlier, uh, using a natural conversational tone. A big one, minimizing distractions, you know, turning off the TV, turning off the radio when you're trying to have that communication interaction, um, you know, involving the aphasic patient in family decisions, family matters, they may not be able to communicate, but not isolating them. I think that's, that's a huge one. Um, and, and helping them realize that, you know, getting out, getting, joining clubs, trying to return to some of their, their hobbies that they, and their leisure activities that they enjoyed before. They may have to do it a different way but still getting out there and participating. So I, how important is it for friends and family to be part of this recovery and therapy process? It's, it's a huge, a huge part. Um, you know, that patient can come to therapy and then go home and not have anybody around to practice with. They're not going to make as fast a recovery or any progress per se. Um, and I think for the family to understand that Again, this person has not changed. They're still the same person that they were. They just cannot get that language out. Um, so I think, you know, many times that helps the family realize that it's the same person. How is technology helping aphasia patients? Again, we talked about those augmentative communication devices where the patient can push a button. It has an icon of a picture, let's say, of a home and we can program that device to say, I live at 2475 Main Street, or this is my phone number. Um, there's also computer programs that a patient can get on to practice at home. Um, I've had computer programs where they actually show movements of the mouth, forming of the words, and the patient can try to imitate that. Um, programs on computers that help with their reading comprehension. So that, that really has helped a, a great deal. Can you share with our listeners where you offer speech therapy services in the Mercy Hospital community? Exactly. Um, again, we talked about in-house, that continuum of care, 
uh, acute bedside, and then our rehabilitation unit. On an outpatient basis, um, we now provide our speech therapy uh, at three locations, our Whipple, uh, North Canton on Whipple. Um, we had to move our, our, our outpatient therapy out of the hospital during the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. We wanted to decrease the in and out of traffic at the hospital. Um, so they are now located at our Whipple Center. And I, we have speech therapy at uh, the Carrollton facility Carrollton Therapy Department, as well as the uh, Tuscarawas Health Center in New Philadelphia on an outpatient basis. Okay. So I also understand that Mercy Therapists offer a stroke support group. Mm -hmm. Would this be beneficial to aphasia patients and their loved ones? Uh, definitely. Um, I'm one of the facilitators for our support group, along with Julie Dominic, who is our occupational therapist. Um, it's an excellent group. We have all types of stroke survivors, some with aphasia, some not, some with cognitive disorders, but just to see the interaction of our stroke survivors and their caregivers, um, it's an inspiration to me uh, just to, to see how they've accepted, um, how they're moving on, giving advice to new members. Uh, we have grown over the past, we've been doing this now, I can't believe this, for 27 years. We started out just as a small group in individual patients' homes, uh, moved to North Canton, we outgrew that. We are now meeting at um, St. Lutheran or St. Stephen Martyr Lutheran Church at the corner of Dressler and Fulton in their sanctuary because we needed such a large room. We now have about 20 to 30 members, um, both stroke survivors and their caregivers. When does that group meet? We meet the third Tuesday of every month and usually about between about 6.30 to 8.30. Um, now in July, next month, we were having our picnic. Um, the church has been uh, gracious enough to allow us to use their pavilion. So it's more of a social gathering. Um, and then in December, we try to have some kind of holiday celebration as well. But it's always the third Tuesday of each month. Okay. Can you take a moment before we wrap up and share your contact information and the website information for listeners that need more information about aphasia and speech therapy at Mercy? Uh, definitely. Um, they can always reach me at the hospital, um, and I have a phone number here. It's area code 330-489-1231, and that's my direct office line. I do have voicemail in case I'm not here. Um, you can reach Julie Dominic also at the North Canton facility, and that's 330-966-8920. And, and we can give you information, my, myself more about the aphasia, but both of us about our stroke support group. Very good. I think we're out of time, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> we had an interesting discussion. Thank you very much yeah. um, today. Debbie Adam Shoemaker, Manager and Licensed Speech Pathologist, Cleveland Clinic Mercy Therapy Services. We'd like to remind our listeners, if you suspect you have a medical issue, please contact your healthcare provider. Thanks to the Cleveland Clinic Mercy Hospital, Studio Arts and Glass, and of course, our technical producer, J.D. DeAngelis, as always, we thank our listeners for joining us on Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Have a healthy week, and we'll see you right here next Friday on News Talk 1480 WHBC.